Welcome to this exciting roundtable on panning for liquid gold, water scarcity and future solutions. I'm Sasha Kadri, Senior Programming Director at Bloomberg Live, and we have a great lineup of panellists. And if you'd like to know more about them, please visit their speaker bios on the forum portal. Now, we're in an age where sustainability is crucial for us and the generations to come. It's a critical decade on all fronts, whether we're discussing biodiversity, global warming or water. And our mandate on a global level is to live in a much more sustainable way than we are currently doing. Now, when it comes to water, UN SDG 6 to ensure the availability and sustainable management of water for all is sadly something we're quite far from achieving. Now, let me share some statistics. Over 2 billion people globally lack safely managed drinking water, over 4 billion lack safely managed sanitation, and 3 billion lack basic hand washing facilities at home. And obviously that has even more implications in a COVID world. So we're going to look at this and more in detail. And as we have such a diverse group of industries from water technology solutions to ag tech to oil and gas, I'd like to start this discussion by getting views on how you believe we can be more sustainable globally when it comes to water and specifically what you're doing within your business to address this. And Matthew, maybe I could start with you, please. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Masha. And great forum. Thanks to the panel. You know, 70 percent of the use of water globally is, um, is, is, is allocated for agricultural use. And one of the biggest problems with agriculture today is we have systems that are specifically based on synthetic inputs and not water retention. So we have evaporative systems that result in desertification of land over time. So this is well documented. And you can look you know, throughout the last century on satellite maps, how land has become more and more sparse in greenery and has retained less water. And building systems fundamentally that are reliant on keeping water in the ground includes processes like cover cropping, like creating alternative crop rotations by building biodiversity in soil, and by uh, allowing systems which are, are focused on regenerative agriculture. Some of the problems that we have today that we focus on at my company, Cook's Venture, to help keep land covered and water in soil to preserve um, use of land and, and natural water from evaporating from soil are um, creating livestock that have access to, to um, low density feed. So as opposed to eating more conventional systems that we created in, during the green revolution of corn and soy crop rotation uh, fertilized by petrochemicals, we're focused on utilization of diverse small grains that can be grown in rotations and cover cropping that can go into animal feed. By far the vast use of land globally is, is land that is, is meant to feed animals. And by creating genetic selection of animals that can monogastrically digest low density feedstock more eventually, we are, are in fact creating better use of land that is keeping water in support. Yeah, interesting. Samo, let me bring you into this conversation, slightly different industry. How are you using water more sustainably? All right. Um, it's my pleasure to be here with the panel. Um, I represent the oil and gas industry. And um, for a lot of people, uh, don't know that the oil and gas industry is both a producer and a consumer of water. Uh, for every barrel of oil we produce conventionally, we have, we have three to five barrels of water comes with it, with the hydrocarbon. In the refining and also with the fracking operation, we use water uh, in, in the opera in operations. Um, overall, I mean, strategically, we are really trying to do um, um, minimizing freshwater consumption. I mean, when you look into the major user with domestic, the competition between domestic uh, agriculture and the industries, I think the industries uh, uh, will have to do something with that. And that's why we are really focusing on minimizing our uh, freshwater consumption, uh, uh, lowering operating costs management of the water as finally when we dispose the water we need to dispose it in an environmentally sustainable manner and to do that really we we have to do uh, to develop innovative uh, solutions for the water management from the oil and gas operation and we have a lot of uh, 
areas around the, uh, um, of our operations, we really are trying to develop fit for purpose solution. There is no mm -hmm. one solution that fits all. Uh, so, and that's why we have to be smart as a, to be effective, cost effective in our running our business. We have to be cost effective in managing our water and that we really spent a great deal of effort into doing it right. And it is part of our environmental, social governments uh, commitment. And uh, it's, it's really our shareholders are expecting it uh, and we're doing it uh, uh, effectively. Absolutely. We, it would be interesting to talk about some of those solutions and about how, how well water is being recycled and reused. Um, Ron, could I bring you in on that? What's your experience been? Sure. I think what we're finding as we look at industry across the board, people are trying to recycle and reuse. I mean, obviously, it's not just because it's the right thing to do. It ultimately is because, you know, you want to preserve the precious resource of water and make sure you, you're getting the most out of it with minimum liquid discharge. In a lot of cases, zero liquid discharge. And, you know, one thing that industry is, is starting to do now is they're starting to take bite-sized pieces around emerging technologies that are coming up and advanced technology. So it's not wait until it gets all the way to the end of the pipe to do it. But it's take it in small pieces, take it in, in different point of use areas and drive that back. And it'll have a tremendous impact. I mean, it goes all the way from, you know, what Samir's talking about on, on oil and gas and what Matthew's talking about with, with actually um, agriculture and ag waste, where we're actually taking waste products from ag and we're using advanced technologies to turn it into renewable natural gas. So we're getting the benefits coming out of waste streams and wastewater instead of just sending it, you know, off to the environment to waste, waste recycling systems. And do you work with industries across the board? Do you, are there any industries where you see particularly a lot of demand for your kind of solutions? I, you know, it's very interesting. It's, it's pretty broadly spread across the board. And, you know, different industry verticals have different challenges that they're dealing with. So whether it's emerging contaminants that are coming out, as, such as, you know, I mean, you're seeing microplastics, PFAS, pharmaceuticals, you name it, selenium in the water that's coming out of oil and gas, what they're fighting with. But, but it's emerging contaminants that people are trying to deal with so that the water is much easier to recycle and reuse on the backside, mm -hmm. all the way to, you know, water scarce regions that need to improve, improve and increase production. Uh, you know, talk about microelectronics and areas that in a lot of cases, fabs are in arid areas. They're not in water rich areas. And so people are trying to recycle and reuse in a lot of cases so they can increase their production. And, and it becomes an economic opportunity as well because you're cutting down on what's going to the waste systems. You're cutting down on what you're having to invest. And it, it is economically viable to recycle and reuse. So it's not just doing the right thing. It's lowering your cost and improving productivity. Absolutely, which is also the bottom line of sustainability. It's not just about doing the right thing. It is also at some point good for business. Um, yep. Shalit, let me bring you in on that. You were nodding a lot while Ron was talking. What's your view on in, what's your view on the solution side? Well, well let, let me let me put things in context before we go to the solution. We live in a human beings. We live in a world. If you look fifty years back, we assume that water is infinite amount available across the globe. We all have enough water. In reality, today, if you look at that, two thirds of the population somehow lives in in any given year for almost a month in a water scarce environment. Look at the consumptions, about 8% of the consumption that goes to the domestic site and rest of the 88, 82%, 92% that goes to industry and agriculture. Mm -hmm. So essentially there is room for improvement. It's not one size fit for all, but there is room for improvement everywhere we use. If you look at it from domestic standpoint, unaccounted for water, non-revenue water. We use all these terms. I live in Qatar, by the way. Look at Qatar perspective. Qatar has one of the highest uh, non unaccounted for water, nearly 32%. Um, uh, global ranges from anywhere between 10 to 75%. So how do we deal with that? The solutions are to begin with the soft skills. And soft skills are reuse, recycle, and those technologies and looking at a holistic approach of water management, as opposed to simply building the reservoirs and simply building the uh, 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 huge uh, conduits 
canals and those type of storage. Mm -hmm. Then it takes us to the technology side. Technology is applicable on wastewater, for example. Technology is applicable equally on domestic wastewater, industrial wastewater, as well as irrigation purposes. Matt and Ron has spoken about it. If you look at domestic wastewater, look at the example of Qatar. Qatar is uh, producing, uh, using almost, producing about 50% of its water as recycles. They have developed the technologies. Of course, uh, vendors like uh, Pat and those folks come in and uh, bring those technologies. But in reality, they're recycling about 50% of the water produced every day. Uh, using ultrafiltration, using reverse osmosis, using uh, ultra UV, UV disinfection and all those mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And my belief is that that water is as good as a potable drinking water. If I did not have an aesthetic issue and put in two cups in uh, two cups, I would not be able to recognize between the two. However, that water is being deployed for a very useful purposes, landscape, uh, car washings, uh, industrial uses, about 25% is being used there. That's a technology which is being employed. Mm -hmm. On the industrial side, a lot of technologies are being, Matt talked about uh, poultry and those things. That water that is produced, almost a big majority of that is being treated and discharged into the water bodies across the globe. What is that? It's a recycling, it's a reuse essentially. Same thing happens with the, 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 with the industrial use as well. So I think it's a time for word or globe as a human human community to look at finding all technology solutions, deploying them, and bringing that water back because it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable over the years and months to come if we did not act today. Absolutely, Ambassador. Let me bring you in talking about Qatar and you know the the technology solutions that you've deployed. How are they? And and you know how. How advanced are you when you compare Qatar with the rest of the world? Well, I think uh, the most important part of what we're talking about in terms of uh, um, uh, water is the affordability. You know, Qatar is really, as I mentioned, is fortunate to be able to afford uh, this, uh, building more and more desalination uh, uh, plant, but there are less uh, developing countries that cannot do that. So I think we have to match uh, uh, the capability of uh, less developed countries uh, providing fresh water. And I have witnessed this in, in some countries. By the way, throughout human civilization, we have seen uh, um, civilization has flourished along sources of, of water, whether it is in, in Egypt or in China or in, in Iraq by the Nile River or by the Euphrates and Tigris or the Yellow River in China. Of course, the increase in population had put a greater demand on fresh water, whether for the use of agriculture or uh, uh, um, for domestic, uh, domestic use. One thing I have to mention about Qatar also that used water uh, um, is used widely in a green area. And there is a program to plant one million tree in Qatar to also uh, face the climate change uh, uh, at the same time. So Qatar um, have used this recycled plant with the state of art uh, uh, technology. I think such discussion really gives the opportunity for all of us to think collect collectively, whether it's the public sector or the private sector, to work to, together to bring uh, a solution, affordable uh, 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 solution. Uh, investing in innovative uh, technology for, for enhancing water protect productivity, conserving and protecting uh, resources. Can, can, I just I jump, think, can, can I just jump in on that? You were saying um, about thinking collectively about water solutions. Is the thought process collective? Is it very disparate? Is it united on a global level? How does it work? Feel free to jump in. And so there, there are a couple of things that I think are important to recognize here globally when we think about use of water. Oftentimes, folks appreciate use of water 
for their specific region or country or, or part of the world, but really in a global economy. When we're moving foods around the globe, specifically foods for consumption. So if you're importing, you know, um, a chicken from, for example, or, or, or beef from the U.S. or, or Canada or, or South America, you know, over Europe or Asia or, or Africa, what we're really doing is we're talking about how we're growing corn and soy that feeds that animal and the use of those regional lands that are feeding those animals. So you might have production of beef in America with um, uh, corn or, or small grains coming from Eastern Europe and soybeans coming from Brazil going to Africa. And how we think about use of water locally is often a global problem and often impactful of millions of acres of land throughout the world. So this is really a global system that we're thinking about. And because predominantly animal agriculture is the main form in which we get protein calories as, as human beings throughout the entire world, that is all derived from agriculture and crops grown for feed. That is also the vast maj majority use of water internationally. So how we think about these problems are not necessarily irrelevant to where we are, to where we live, to where we consume, but they're affecting our supply chain internationally. And how we think about these solutions has to be derived around philosophically, how are we growing our foods regionally? How are we importing our foods? And when you're buying food that's calorically significant for food security for our countries, what is the real cost of that agriculture? What is the real cost of that input to us as people? And how do we better manage that as a global community by building better import and export standards and also creating regional supply chain that, that is more sensible, that does not uh, depreciate water over time. So how do we create more security there and policy around that? Absolutely. But is that, is that united at all or is it very separate depending on which part of the world you're in? Well, I mean, use of water is really derived from the places that are growing the most grain. So you have places in Eastern Europe, you have South America, you have the United States. Folks who have the, the most topsoil produce the most grain. So calorically, we're feeding animals that we're then consuming. So if you look at topsoil throughout the world, that's really the, the gross use of water globally. And preserving topsoil to retain water aids in the reduction of use of, of um, irrigation because we're actually maintaining root systems in soil. In Africa, for example, you've seen throughout the last hundred years desertification take over the continent. And you can look at a map and, and just look at the lines of how nations were born, how conflict was derived, um, how food security became a problem over the course of you know the last um, five or ten decades. And it, it really revolves around agriculture and use of water. Yeah. Kelly, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I will say as we think about water as this global issue, like there is like we are a little bit siloed even within water. Like imagine h sits as kind of this ecosystem player so we get to see this play out. But for instance, like it's really interesting that people focus on, you know, ag water. I'm an ag water person. I'm a river person. I'm an oceans person. I'm a utility person. But in reality, like we've been working with a lot of different groups that it's like, okay, well, actually the ocean health is impacted by that ag water, wastewater runoff. So how do we get these people all on the same page talking about the same issues? So I'd argue like we are a bit siloed at the moment. I think it's very siloed. I think it's siloed even inside of organizations in a company such as mine. It's siloed by vertical market. It's siloed by need. It's siloed by challenge and geography. So I, I do believe it's siloed. And I think the more we can bring people together to talk about this as a unified front, it's a better opportunity to have the impact. Yeah, I agree. Let's, let's oh, Samu, were you going to add something? No, no, I, I was I was uh, going to agree on this, actually. It's just like the, the question is, is putting it all in perspective, the solutions in one continent is different than another continent. And solutions for uh, an arid region is different than the solutions in a water abundant regions. Actually, we, we, you know, we have operations all over the world. What we are dealing for water management in Texas, for example, is not the same as what we are doing here in Qatar as in Canada and Alaska. So. Uh, again, I, I say that we have to fit for, for, for fit for purpose solution. We could not just install, let's say, reverse osmosis membrane technology to address all the issues here. I mean, it's, 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 then it will become a cost issue. It, uh, so you just need to make sure what is the intended, the water quality, the intended use, and then use a solution that will be cost effective because ultimately 
uh, you know, we just need to uh, uh, we, we do it <clears throat> cost effectively and in a business matter sense. Yeah. Sasha, I, bring you Sasha, in. I, yeah, Patrick, I just wanted to bring Patrick in because yeah. we're talking yeah. about affordability here, Patrick, and you mentioned that earlier. So is it affordable? How is it going to become affordable? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think the uh, the issues as we define them within Xylem are scarcity. Um, scarcity, not, not just at a individual household level, but scarcity in terms of economic expansion. Um, you know, I think as, as Ron was alluding to earlier, I mean, the value of water to an industrial consumer of water is very different than the price per gallon or liter that we pay at the household level. It's what is the cost of your manufacturing line being disrupted and not being able to, uh, you know, deliver your product or expand. Uh, then we talk about resilience. You know, we used to talk about resilience of water infrastructure around climate change, which is still obviously, you know, existential. Now we talk about pandemic uh, impacts uh, and how our utility brothers and sisters around the world are able to, uh, you know, sustain the shocks of the system. I mean, Peter, the CEO of Singapore, uh, uh, you know, PUB, I was on a panel with him the other day and he was talking about resilience, sustaining shocks at a utility level is his number one concern right now. You mentioned those shots of affordability. I mean, this is all great, but how are we going to pay for it? And it's not just at a uh, macroeconomic level. It's not just at a municipality level. Uh, you know, in the U.S., uh, you know, Samir, you were talking about and the ambassador was talking about the ability of Qatar to be able to pay for these things here in the U.S., the 20 percent of our wage owners or the people that make the, le the least 20 percent of wages in the U.S., the water bill represents up to 20 percent of their net take home pay. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that's why, in our view, uh, the new technologies that exist. And I wrote this down. Already, the technologies already exist today to solve these problems. They do. Uh, now, do we have the right business models? Do we have the right engagement models? Do we have, have we gotten rid of silos to get people to come together? Uh, you know, policymakers versus private sector versus the public? No. Uh, but that, quite frankly, is our legacy as leaders on this call. I'm old school call on this session is to say, what can we do to galvanize those people who can influence to say, let's get together and have a serious conversation <laughs> and bring these solutions to market. Uh, you know, it's the main hurdle then, Patrick. I mean, you mentioned so many things there, but yeah, there are lots of hurdles. What's the biggest one? Uh, I think it's awareness. I mean, I, look, I, I think that I'm going to give you some very specific examples where utility leaders and cities and governments are getting it together. Singapore, 40 percent of its water supply comes from reuse. Uh, in, the, in California, the Terminal Island Reclamation Plant, they're now producing 12 million gallons per day of high quality water. Uh, Qatar, you know, we've got technology there that is helping the Qatari government deal with leak detection. This whole issue of non-revenue water, we've been talking about this forever. Uh, this is like a low hanging fruit, <laughs> go get, go get revenue along the way. Uh, you know, we're partnering with the, a water utility in Malaysia where on their network, they've reduced the number of leaks by a third of what they were dealing with before. Uh, and I'm not doing this as a paid commercial advertisement for Xylem. Ron, you and other companies have tremendous technologies in these areas. We just have to showcase what these leaders are doing uh and i just don't think that we do enough of that when we come together as a group like this today was a bit different but normally we just we talk past each other yeah right. kelly kelly let me bring you in here because you you must come across a lot of solutions you were in an accelerator what kind of you know what's your response to what patrick's saying 
Um, we agree a lot with that, what Patrick is saying. Like when he's talking about the water leaders not being seen, like I like to call them the invisible heroes sometimes because they're Absolutely. never really talked about, which is crazy to me. And like this whole idea of breaking down the silos is what we're trying to do at Imagine H2O. And as Patrick was talking about, like it's not all brand new tech. We have a lot of the tech we need. It needs to get in the hands of the people that need it the most which requires a lot of business model innovation. So a lot of entrepreneurs that are entrepreneurs, right, working at the big companies, as well as kind of new innovators that can see, oh wait, there was like an issue within this marketplace. Here's how I'm going to fix that and work with the Zions of Oakwood with everyone in the different countries. So I think that's where we see it at Imagine H2O. Um, last year, we looked at over 300 different solutions and the big ones were around, you know, this drinking water, wastewater treatment and reuse, like Ron talked about, network management and leak detection, like Patrick was talking about, and as well as, you know, ag tech that Matthew was talking about is still quite a big um, scene of what we're looking at in terms of the new entrepreneurs, but it's still miles off the mainstream, right? Even in the early stage side of things. And and Kelly, I, I would yeah, just I would offer up, Sasha, that I, I think that, and I was having this conversation around with some investors yesterday around the whole ESG movement, uh, the whole sustainability movement, and the burden that places on businesses. And I said, it's not a burden. It's those of us who are focused on it and take it seriously are opening up entirely new markets to grow our companies. This is not a burden. If you think it's a burden... I mean, retire. Okay, game over. Okay. Uh, but but are, you saying, are you saying that, that despite so much focus on sustainability, the appetite to invest in and to take these water technologies seriously, it's just not there? No, I think, it, I think it's growing. Um, and I think there's a big, to your question of what can we do, I think there's just still a big spotlight and, and education to be done. I mean, Everything we're talking about here is a catalyst to economic growth. We're talking about investments uh, that create jobs along the way. Uh, there are all kinds of studies that are out there around the infrastructure bill, not just right now in the U.S., but we were part of the Bipartisan Council on Infrastructure se seven years ago. And the study was out there that there is a significant multiplier of job creation by investing in basic infrastructure. Uh, and I think, as you said, Kelly, just just spotlighting those utilities and leaders that are out there at a, a political level that are actually doing something and celebrating them versus criticizing the industry for being risk adverse. Well, folks, I, 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 I'm a water engineer by background. Uh, I, I, we talk a lot about technology. It's imperative. It's imperative for the future, for sustainability. But, but my view is that you have to look at holistic approach. You cannot disrupt the hydrological cycle, hydrologic cycle, and assume that your technologies, our technologies will be able to keep us as resilient as we were numerous years ago. Public education is the key. And I think I, I fully agree with Patrick. There is, I, 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 the, the, there is an absolute lack of public education and equally importantly, leadership education. People who do not deal with water, they don't understand. They go dig the hole and water comes out. They open the tap, water comes out. <laughs> do, you, do, you think, um, do you think the pandemic has, has slowed things down further when it comes to making progress in this field? I actually do not. Yeah, I, I think do. it's gone the other direction, Ron. What yeah. do you think? I agree 100 percent. I think the pandemic is actually moving it forward. A lot more, you know, a lot more rapidly on sustainability, what people are focused on doing. I mean, ultimately, we're trying to do more with less. We're trying to do more digitally, more in connected solutions. So we're not there having to be in person touching it all the time. We actually can do it remote. And in driving that, I see, you know, I mean, we're seeing an outcry from our industrial customers, industrial uh, manufacturers and operators that are saying we need to minimize our liquid discharge. We need to have an impact on our footprint. And, and it needs to be something that's tangible. And they look for partners. And I think, you know, to Patrick's point, the technology is there. It's available. We just have to have a more rapid deployment of the technology. And as industrial consumers are 
changing the place the water decisions are made. It's no longer made in a utility room. It's not even made at a plant manager level. It's made across a, a supply chain, a global supply chain. It's driving that value there. And I think we're seeing the adoption rate increase significantly. Yeah, that, that's totally right. And Pat, Patrick, it, you brought a smile to my face. I think it's so ironic that there's this whole, I, I'm in the ESG world. So, you know, if people are so hungry for ESG investments, but it's so funny to hear the other side of the story where it can be considered a burden to some. But I, I feel like the, the paradox there is that we're living right now in the last few months, anybody who follows the futures markets where corn and soy have doubled. If, you know, corn exactly. went from $2.50 to $7.00. And of course, as we know, you know, that's based on rainfall, that's based on um, local environmental conditions. And this is all derived from local water systems. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's funny that there's a resistance to sort of understand these problems and build diversity and sustainability and um, conservation into those systems, which ultimately are, are reducing the cost of agriculture, creating food access, um, creating uh, uh, economic um, uh, possibilities for folks who, who might not have that food security in their lives. So all these things, I think, work together and, and our systems and um, how we think about them uh, ne needs to be a part of that that general story between consumers and businesses and and, and policy. Yeah. The good news is we need to focus. We're, we're, we're getting there. We're, we're we need to there. focus on where it makes sense. Actually, there is a lot of uh, water recycling, for example, and reuse, it, it, it's, it's a, uh, it makes sense for a lot of industries, whether because we have a lot of water that we produce and we have a lot of water that we have to dispose, actually. So have, closing the loop with the water recycling makes business sense, actually. So it's not really that when you talk about the cost, you, then you are making it economically better. You could be operating, it's a license to operate and it costs effectively by doing our recycling. It's not about the technologies. The technologies are existing, but we need to select the right technology for the right uh, place. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think having, uh, we were thinking it's really costly. Okay? In many cases, it makes even business sense to do that recycling with those technologies. Uh, and it will be better and cost effective. And those are the initial projects that are popping up here in Qatar Gas in Qatar. They really have to minimize the disposal, uh, okay, as well as they want to minimize the consumption of the highly the, the expensive desalinated water in a way. So what they did here in liquefied natural gas, they installed technologies, membrane bioreactor with reverse osmosis, to recycle that process water and use the permeate the product water from the reverse osmosis for boilers feed water. So they minimize the desalinated water consumption. And at the same time, they are only disposing the concentrate from the reverse osmosis. So they, they achieve two birds, they, they catch two birds in one stone. So they address the disposal issue. They address the recycling issue. In, in, so those are the type of examples that are making sense. In our operations in Texas, the recycling makes it a lot more effective to for our fracking operations uh, and i'll end with like education and conserve um, awareness i think that's very important this is really especially in arid regions i think qatar is one of the highest per capita uh, um, consumers of water but there's a lot of efforts actually that's being done by the kahrama the water agency here there is a mega awareness park we have here in our water center an education center to to, to educate the children on the value of water and the need for conservation. I mean, this is a generational education. You could, a lot of people think that water is from the faucet actually, but when they come to the centers and they learn how much does it take to desalinate the water, then they become a lot more, uh, uh, you know, aware of what they are using in a way. Absolutely. Actually, everyone's talked about the importance of education. Ambassador, what can you talk a bit more about what you're doing in Qatar regarding education? And do you think the population is generally quite well versed on the problem? Yes, uh, I think. Uh, um, well, first of all, I would like to say that uh, uh, this conversation that really brings us all together in, in, in terms of, of the technology uh, side, uh, policy side, uh, public sector, uh, uh, private sector, and it's always a big or a good opportunity to continue after this uh, 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 discussion because that creates business, that brings 
uh, uh, that brings us uh, closer to together uh, to create jobs. One aspect I would nobody have talked about, and that is really the effects of, of the technology in terms of use of technology on a climate change, because we also have to address the climate change issue when we also talk about uh, technology. Uh, another factor is the um, water waste, because in some of the big cities, uh, whether here in Doha or on other capital uh, in the region, a lot of water wasted because there is leakage in these old pipes and nobody is really paying enough attention. So there also be have to be um, more investment in infrastructure rather than uh, produce the capacity of water, no treat what you have so you can always uh, uh, yeah. uh, save uh, uh, on water. For me, education, education is very important for young generation. I think because also we have water for part of the citizen free. So they have to be more responsible in how to utilize, how to value each drop of water. Uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a desert climate like Qatar or our neighboring countries, uh, uh, Kuwait and, and other Gulf uh, region, if we educate our kids about the value of water, I think we are investing for the future. Hey, Sasha, I'd, I'd love to, if I could jump in on that one, because I, I think the ambassador makes a, a very compelling point here. Uh, I am a big believer that as we create awareness and education of the younger generation around, uh, you know, the needs around water, and I agree with the comment was made earlier, it's not the water sector. I mean, water is integral life, so it's not like it's an industry. I hate when people talk about the water industry. It just drives me nuts. Uh, the but when you when you talk to students uh, on a college campus or a high school, and I say to them, the World Economic Forum says that by 2050, 25 percent of the world's population is going to be facing absolute water scarcity. I talked about the the whole 20 percent, 20 percent of lowest wage earners versus price of the water bill. When I say those things to youth. And I explain to them that while 2050 seems a long time from now, but by the time they're my age, we're there and life goes by pretty, pretty fast. You get their attention. And then when you tell them, oh, by the way, and the technologies to Ron's point exist to solve these problems. Mr. Ambassador, I mean, I'll give you two examples that always light the kids up when I tell them stormwater overflow. So one of the biggest challenges that any utility and city or government around the world faces, the technologies exist today and they've already been deployed and it's not just Xylem, there are other companies that are out there. So I give all of them the credit as well to solve those problems at about 25% of the cost traditionally that was required by using data and digital technologies to enlighten them around the performance of their current network. Uh, we've got countless examples of that as do other companies. Two, uh, your comment around water leakage and water losses. When, when kids hear that on average, we're looking at somewhere between 30 to 40% water losses around the world and the technologies exist to solve those problems, but they're not being deployed consistently around the world, they get angry. It's like, I mean, what is the, what is the problem? What is the problem? Okay. And, and I, I just think that as much as I honor and respect our political leaders, there needs to be a movement here to say this need not be so difficult. Uh, mm -hmm. And so when I talk about affordability, Sasha, I'm, I'm not talking about that in the classic, oh my God, where's the money going to come from? I'm speaking about it from the standpoint of we know where the money can come from if we simply apply solutions right now that exist to get at it. And that's where it requires the political will. Yeah. So the is, is that, does the impetus have to come from government? If it's not coming from government, is it corporations that need to just be taking the lead as they are doing in so many other fields? Well, well, you, you have to have some government uh, responsibility here because one of the problems that we have today 
is we have a subsidized corn and soy economy in the US. And we know that by growing some alternative grains or non-GMOs, which are, are not subsidized in the same kind of way as conventional corn and soy, during drought years, yields are reduced on GM crops, which are subsidized with our tax dollars, of course, and go into essentially feeding herbicide, chemical industry, petrochemicals, et cetera. And as a fact, USDA did a big report before the far, far, last farm bill and determined that increased yields and drought resistance with certain kinds of crops is viable and encouraged. However, our policy does not support those growing systems. So farmers are actually penalized for growing alternative crops and the market is not therefore supporting that. Mm -hmm. So you have to have policy that interacts in an intelligent way with growers to keep root systems and water in the ground to preserve local water systems. Because globally, we're reliant on those systems where they matter. And what's going to force the change then? Well, I think you know, in the US, uh, Vilsnack has made some announcements recently talking about billions of dollars of infra infrastructure and, and um, advancements into regenerative agricultural systems. It is not yet determined what they're going to do. Of, of course, the beating drum of politics always. Uh... Oops, uh, we lost Matt again. Okay. I, but I, I to just to, just to pick up one. on it. Yeah, go, go yeah. ahead, Ron. Yeah, to pick up on this, I mean, it, it it has to come from ag. I think there is some policy making that needs to happen. But frankly, ESG, ESG investors, they're driving the industrial producers to do this. So I, I do think that movement is very good. I think it's very strong. You know, to Patrick's point earlier, this is an opportunity. It's not a burden. It's it's something that we should all be focused on and doing. And it's going to have a significant impact. So the investment community is helping drive that, but but we're driving it through education. You have to drive it through education so people know what is available, how do we do it. What are the actions we need to take that will have a tangible impact at the backside? And I think that's a lot of what Matt's talking about on the on the ag side to get the government and policymakers behind that as well has to happen. Yeah. What, what do you think is a realistic timeline for when, you know, we talk a lot about how this is a critical decade when it comes to climate change. What is the critical timeline for water, for education, for deploying technology that already exists? What is yes, the critical ben. timeline? Yesterday, <laughs> as soon as possible. I mean, if, if you look at if you look at the investment, we are numerous uh, billions behind in terms of spending on the existing infrastructure, improving the uh, uh, aging infrastructure. We are years behind using the technology, which does not detect the, the leakages and in, in the system. We are not metering it coming to a you know. Uh, uh, metering the system in a way that it's properly, accurately reflecting the revenue and essentially causing an awareness to the end user to manage it appropriately as opposed to just keep the faucet open. So uh, I, I think we are behind, but still time is not out of our hands. And I don't. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. I just want to add a point is that you, you mentioned the point that the, the technology that already exists. I just want also. I want to make sure that we still need to also improve on the current technology that we have. So there is room for research and development. I, I want to make sure because w while the technology is there, maybe it is developed for municipal wastewater recycling or so, but when you bring it to the oil and gas, you need to still go through a qualification process. And there is, while the technologies are there, many of them, there is room for improvement to come up with a lower cost. So I, I want to continue the research and development and innovation. We are not there yet. There is room for improvement as well. Yeah. Samir, I think it's, it's a great point in that um, I, I think I think where Ron and I are coming from there is that there are plenty enough bright minds around the world that uh, know what the challenges are and are getting after it. Uh, it's more the adoption along the way. Uh, Sasha, you you ask like, uh, you know, when when is it going to happen or when's it have to happen? Uh, Ron said yesterday, uh, I'll be a little bit facetious. Uh, Joni Mitchell's. Uh, famous album called Blue it turns 50 today. Um, and Blue's not just the connection to water, but it's how quickly time goes by. And we don't have a lot of time to get at this. 
Um, and so I just hope that I hope that some of the younger folks that are watching today realize this this is the opportunity of their lifetime, and they really need to challenge us. Uh, and you know the entire kind of leadership around them. It's not just political. It's okay. it's the entire system. I'm afraid let's I'm, have have to to jump in. In. I'm going to have to jump in there because actually we're right out of time. But thank you all for being such an amazing panel and such a great conversation. Appreciate you all making the time to join us and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So long. Thank you. Thank you.